Welcome back everybody, it's Steve from Featherlight. And first and foremost, I just wanna say congratulations for making it this far. Truly, we have done an amazing amount of work together throughout this entire tutorial. In the last video, we learned all about how to export all of our hard work outside of Cubase, either into an MP3 file or a WAV file or even stems. And this, we're gonna do the exact opposite. We're gonna take that finished WAV file that we exported and we're gonna import it back into Cubase and we're gonna learn how to master. And mastering in a nutshell is basically the last final professional step that your audio goes through before it goes out to record duplication plants or streaming services. It's also where things like metadata and ISRC codes are embedded. So those are really important steps because they determine what happens to your audio when it gets out onto streaming services. So let's dive in and find out a little bit more about how to master our finished product inside of Cubase. A few things to consider before you even begin the mastering process. First, your monitoring environment. If you have an excessively noisy or highly problematic or reflective room environment, consider using one of the online mastering services or having another person do your mastering for you. While it can be helpful to check your mix and your masters on headphones, it's always a good idea to work on high quality near field monitors from a trusted manufacturer. Once you establish a comfortable working level, it is extremely important that this level does not change from session to session, which can skew your perception of loudness. Always use a commercially mastered reference track in the genre or style of music that you're working in. This vital step helps you compare your work against other commercial levels, as well as tonal ranges. While it's technically possible to put effects on your two bus and master while you mix down, you rob yourself of the most important part of mastering, and that's the perspective of the three stages of recording, tracking, mixing, and finally mastering. Cubase actually includes a mastering template, and it has one stereo mastering template if we choose that and hit create, and then we can take a look at what Cubase or Steinberg suggests that we use. It's got a couple of different plugins here. Let's enlarge the project so we can see it full screen. We'll switch over to the console view so we can see the routing more clearly, and we can see that there's two basic effects on our stereo master bus. This isn't a good or bad starting point, but it's incredibly limiting, and it doesn't address some mastering concerns we'll need to deal with. So let's start from scratch instead. We'll create and name a new project in Cubase instead. We've already got a basic one going here for demonstration purposes. Let's check it out. It's a simple two-track project, but it includes the most important thing of any mastering project, and that is the reference track. It doesn't matter whether it's rap or metal or EDM or pop or hip hop, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you have a commercially mastered track in the genre that you're working in to judge your work against. Our reference track here is a very popular pop song, which we can't play, obviously, because of YouTube's copyright, but we can tell a lot from the visual indication of the track itself. We can see the peaks relative to the body of the wave, which gives us a lot of information about the density or loudness of it, and we can see the overall wave shape, whether it's distorting or whether it was imported way too quietly. And the second track here is our mix down track. So let's do that now. Let's go up to File. Let's hit Import and import it into our mastering session. Let's enlarge the clips, and at this stage, we simply want to ensure that we have a good quality export, not too hot and not too quiet. So if it comes in looking like this and it's way too low, it is possible to fix at the mastering stage, but you're going to be increasing the volume of it dramatically, and in doing so, you're going to add noise. So it's much easier to fix at the mix stage and simply correct it there and export it correctly. And the same is true in reverse. If the wave shape you've exported comes in looking more like this, it may look closer to the wave above it, but it really isn't. If we look at the top of the wave shape here, we can clearly see that many of those musical events have simply been cut off. And once that information has been clipped or distorted like that, there's no way to retrieve it. It's simply gone for good. So the takeaway here is that there really is no replacement for a well-mixed dynamic performance that's been exported correctly. The first thing we're gonna do for our mastering session is change some of our mix architecture. We're gonna jump over to the console view and we're gonna move our stereo master outputs over to the right hand side of our console view. This just makes our workflow much clearer when we're comparing our individual track or channel effects with our master bus effects. The next step is to start adding effects to our mastering effects chain. 
And we're going to start off with Steinberg's Frequency EQ. The purpose of a mastering EQ is to make global overall additive or subtractive changes to the sound of the mix before it hits any downstream processing. The next insert effect we're going to use is Steinberg's Multiband Compressor. The purpose of a mastering multiband compressor is to divide up your song into individual frequency bands and then rein in highly dynamic performances within each one of those band areas. The next effect in our mastering chain is going to be Steinberg's Maximizer plugin, and this is going to be responsible for the bulk of the volume increase on our imported wave. All these plugins are part of the standard Cubase Pro installation. However, if you're an artist, you can substitute the frequency EQ with the studio EQ. And the multiband compressor can be substituted with the regular compressor inside of Cubase. In both versions, you just won't have access to its multiband capabilities. The next effect we're gonna to add to our mastering effects chain is Steinberg's Magneto 2. This is a great tape emulation plugin. We're going to use this to add a little character and warmth to our imported audio track. And the final effect we're going to add to our mastering effects chain is going to be Steinberg's brick wall limiter. And where we put this is important in the signal chain. This one is going to go in the post position. So we're going to drop it down here into this amber colored slot. That signifies that it's going to be in the post position, which means any changes made to the signal that might push it into clipping, the brick wall limiter will act as a safety valve and catch those peaks. Now that we have our basic mastering effects chain, it's time to add some effects to our master stereo out. Pay attention to this little green line here. Just like the channel, this signifies pre and post locations. And the first is gonna be Steinberg's Supervision Meter Tool. This is a powerful and flexible meter tool, and it's gonna allow us to make some critical decisions about our mix as we go forward. And then the last effect we're gonna insert is gonna be in our post or amber colored position is Steinberg's UV-22. We'll get more into this when we talk more about our export options later. There are several different methods to set up a DAW for mastering, but this particular method of just putting the measurement tools on the master bus allows us to switch back and forth between our reference and our mastered audio without worrying about downstream effects. Now that our mix architecture has been set up, the first effect we're gonna work with is the mastering EQ. Our mix sounds like this with nothing going on. To the right of our auto listen button is our configuration options wheel. If we click on that, we can change a bunch of different display options and hold times and peak values. We can change it from the default graph that we see here into a bar graph. Overall, the mix is fairly clean and well balanced. We don't need to fix a lot of different things, but on playback here, if we look at the RTA, we can see that there's a little bit of a buildup in the 200 Hertz category that needs to be thinned out. So that's right around here. That could be lowered just a little bit. So we're gonna pull just a little bit of that out of here. Unlike the mixing stage, the changes we make at the mastering stage will be subtle changes, just a few dB here or there in problem areas. And the other area of concern is between the two and three K area. It's a little bit strident there. So we're gonna scoop out just a little bit of the frequency there as well. And be mindful that the cues that we're using when we cut will be fairly narrow. The cue is the bell shape of the actual filter and we wanna make sure that when we're cutting, they're fairly narrow and when we're boosting, they're fairly wide. This style of subtractive and additive EQing gives us a much more musical result. All right, so right around here in this area here as we solo the band simply by clicking on the node, there's a little bit of a buildup around the three and four K area. So we're gonna do the same thing here. We're just gonna dip this out very, very slightly. And we're really only gonna take out about 2.5K. Following the EQ is the multiband compressor. And in mastering, it's important to understand that just because you have an effect in your mastering chain doesn't mean it needs to be used all the time. If you have a wildly dynamic mix that has out of control highs, mids, or lows, this can be a powerful tool, but it can also do as much damage as it can repair. So it's best to approach a multiband with caution in mastering. Steinberg gives us some great presets to get started with, and there's a lot of stuff and a lot of genres here, but most of them are a little bit too heavy handed for what we're doing in this particular example. So we're gonna choose a preset called Reset. And this just resets all of the parameters back to their factory defaults. And this gives us a great starting point. Multiband compressors basically break up your song into four fundamental frequency areas, low, 
mids, high mids, and high frequency. This allows us to work on each individual band or frequency range independent of the other. So for the time being, let's think of this as four different vacuum cleaners. Whichever frequency range or band your vacuum cleaner sits on top of is what it's going to start sucking up. If it sits on the low end, it's going to start sucking up low end. And same for the highs and the mids. And how much stuff gets sucked up is determined by two things, the ratio and the threshold knobs. When something in your mix is highly dynamic or loud enough and it crosses a certain threshold, the vacuum cleaner turns on. And after it turns on, what determines how strong or powerful the suction is, is determined by the ratio knob. By clicking and dragging up here in the range window, we can change the frequency that each one of these bands or vacuum cleaners will work on. You'll notice in each one of the frequency areas, there's a little dot at the top of each each one of the bands. This is the volume control or makeup gain for each one of the bands. First thing you notice here is that it's sucking an awful lot out of this band range. So let's bypass this. Now we have those mids back. That vacuum cleaner is working overtime in this area here, and it's working overtime a little too much. It's sucking a lot of the mid-range energy out of the mix. So we're going to go to each one of the band's threshold knobs and crank them all the way back to zero, which basically means none of them are going to be doing anything at the moment. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change where these sit. They're a little broad for what we're doing for a rock song. We need a little bit more even control of these. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go through each band and we're going to drop the threshold until we start to see some gain reduction in each one of the bands. So there's the bottom end. We start seeing that. So when we start to see gain reduction, we're going to back it off so it just starts to kind of get the very top. Now we're going to move on to the mid-range band, the low mids. And because there's a lot of energy from the guitar and the bass guitars in the low mids here, this setting is gonna be different than the low end setting will be. And then we just repeat the same process for all the additional bands. The third effect in our mastering chain is gonna be Steinberg's maximizer. And this is gonna be the bulk of where our volume increase actually comes from. The interface is pretty straightforward. You got a couple different algorithms to choose from, classic or modern. We'll get more into that later, but for the time being, we're gonna leave it on classic. Our mix knob basically determines how much of the mix will be affected by this, in this case, 100%. If we drop this down to anything lower, it becomes a parallel processor. For the time being, we're going to leave this at 100% and we're going to keep our output at 0 dB. This is important as we don't want the output of the EQ to overdrive the input of the multiband and so on. We want to make sure that all the inputs and outputs of the effects stay at zero or unity gain. This is known as good gain staging so that nothing is overdriving anything else. And following our maximizer plugin, is Magneto 2, and this is Steinberg's tape emulation plugin. It's quite good, and we're gonna make a few changes. We're first gonna go up to the presets window, and we're gonna choose a preset called Reel to Reel. This is a great starting point, but we're gonna change a few things. We're first gonna adjust the high frequency. We're actually gonna roll this back by about a dB or a bit more, and this is just gonna kind of take some of that digital edge off of it, and we're gonna make sure that the output stays at zero dB, so we keep our gain staging in check. We're going to keep the frequency knobs the same and the saturation and leave it in dual mode for the time being just to add a bit of analog warmth and character to the overall mix. Now we want to call up our maximizer plugin and put it side by side with our brick wall limiter that's in the post position. These two devices are going to work side by side to help us achieve our overall master level. For streaming, that's around minus 14 LUFS. And for physical media like CDs, that's going to be higher. So in order to do that, we need to take advantage of Steinberg's metering tools, which are extensive and powerful. We're going to come up here to the little tabbed window box area up here and choose the right one. That opens the right zone. And at first we see the peak meter. This is the standard true peak meter in Cubase. And we can see that the brick wall limiter is doing a great job at keeping our true peak level at right around minus 1.0 dB. That gives us plenty of headroom. Come down here to the lower right area and choose the loudness meter. And this opens up Steinberg's LUFS meter or loudness units full scale meter. And this is the meter we're going to be using to set our streaming levels with. If you're working in Cubase Artist, you won't have the full-size loudness meter features and right zone features that Cubase Pro does. However, you can go up to your two bus inserts area and on the very last slot after the UV22 dither module, 
we can come down here and select another version of Supervision. Once inserted, we simply need to change the metering configuration choices. We go to Level, choose the drop-down menu, and select Loudness. This is exactly the same loudness information and readout as the full-size Cubase Pro, only it's in a configurable module that we can move around. So from here, we'll get that exact same playout information. We want to make one change to the meter, and we'll come up here to the configuration wheel, and we'll open the module settings, and we'll choose 18 dB scale, and all this does is give us a much broader view of the range of the digital meter readout. If you're working in a version of Cubase that's before version 11 and doesn't include supervision, you can use the Ulean LUFS meter. This is one of the best commercially available meters that measures loudness and true peak meter reading. And this VST plugin just happens to be free of charge. I'll leave this info in the links below. You'd simply insert it in place of the supervision in its current slot location directly after the last thing in the master bus, which is the UV22 dither module, and you are good to go for metering. Back in Cubase Professional and its full-size LUFS meter, we're going to come up to the configuration wheel, and the first thing we're going to change is 18 dB scale. This just gives us a broader overview of the meter reading itself. And as we hit playback, we can see that our reading currently is at about minus 15 or a little lower than that. The LUFS meter takes its reading over time, and it averages the overall playback level of your song and gives you a reading here at the integrated mark. Most modern day streaming services, including iTunes and Spotify, require your master to be submitted somewhere around the minus 14 LUFS mark. If it's higher than that or significantly lower than that, they will re-encode your master without your permission to make it reach that playback level. And that presents some problems. If you send them an excessively quiet master and they re-encode it, now it'll be a noisy one because they're gonna bring the noise floor up as they re-encode it. If you send them an excessively loud master with very little dynamic, they're gonna re-encode it. And now you're gonna have the exact same level of song as everybody else, except your song is gonna sound really lifeless because it won't have any dynamics. So we're gonna hit playback and we're gonna to begin to raise the optimize wheel here on our maximizer until we see our integrated level begin to increase. Now this measurement is gonna be made over time. In fact, the entire length of the song, which means if you have dramatically quiet sections of your song and loud sections of your song, you'll need to let it play through the entire length of it before this measurement reflects any accurate meaning. There's a couple of different schools of thought where this is concerned since most of the streaming services require your master to be submitted at minus 14. You need to keep in mind that this is an average reading over time. If your song has significantly quiet sections, then those quiet sections are gonna factor into that overall reading, which means you might need to master it a little higher than minus 14 to make up the difference between the balance of the quiet and loud sections. And this is where our commercially mastered reference track starts to play a really important role in the mastering process. When we switch to our reference track and play it back, even though we can't play it to you because of copyright reasons, we can clearly see that the overall integrated reading is higher than minus 14 LUFS. This is because it takes into consideration the loudest and quietest parts of the song and still probably would be re-encoded on some streaming services. If you'd like to find out exactly how much of a penalty your master is gonna incur on a streaming service, there's a website designed specifically for that. The Loudness Penalty Analyzer website allows you to drag and drop your master directly onto the applet without uploading it, and it'll give you a numeric readout of exactly how much it will re-encode your wave by. I'll leave this information in the links below as it's an incredibly helpful site in the mastering process. And finally, one last step to check in the mastering process, and this is incredibly important, is to make sure that both the channel volume of the song we're mastering and the stereo outputs of our main outputs are both set to zero dB or unity gain as this directly affects the meter reading itself. Command clicking on either fader will return them back to their zero dB position. And as we mentioned before, this is also why we only have measurement plugins on the master bus, nothing that can change the volume output. As we switch back to our master, we can see as we increase that optimized level that we're getting a higher integrated reading. As we continue to play back our master and check the integrated reading, we can see this is more than enough level to meet the requirements 
for streaming services. In fact, it's a little bit too hot and we could back it off since there is no actual advantage to mastering any hotter, certainly not where streaming services are concerned because of that re-encoding process. So as you can clearly see, today's mastering process includes making several different masters for different applications. For CD duplication, your masters are going to be significantly hotter and that integrated level will be significantly higher. Now it's time to move on to our main stereo outputs or our two bus and look at some of the effects that we put on that earlier. The first up is our SuperVision plugin and we're going to change the display to a panorama. This gives us a stereo view of what our mix looks like. We've got a V3 on the right and some things on the left, but overall it's correctly centered. If this was radically to one side or the other, we might need to go back and do some repairs at the mix stage before proceeding to master. And the next thing that we want to double check before we finish our mastering process is the phase of the song itself. We want to determine whether our song has any significant phase problems. We do this by coming up to the readout and change the display to phase scope. The phase scope is a powerful tool to let us know if we have phase related problems. On this particular display we can see that the bulk of the song's activity is correctly centered between the X. However, if all of the song's material was completely at the top of the display or the bottom, we would know that our song had phase related issues that needed to be addressed before moving on to our final export stage. With all the audio adjustments made to our master completed, it's time to move on to the final stages of the mastering process. And that's our audio exports. And we're going to be doing several for several different applications. The first of which is going to be our MP3 export. And that's going to be for all of our streaming services and social media. This is going to have slightly different requirements than our WAV file exports. So we need to do one thing first before we can export. And that is come up to our two bus, our stereo master outs, and make sure that our UV22 dither module has been disabled. We won't be using that for our MP3 export. From here, we go up to our file menu and navigate down to audio export and choose the audio export dialog box. From here, we can give the song file a title. We can also choose a destination. Cubase has a default destination that's buried inside the project folder, but we're going to change this so that it's on our audio master's hard disk instead. Once we hit save, that simply establishes that location. And we can also change the type here. So our first type of export is gonna be an MP3 file. We would normally choose the bit right here, but we're gonna choose high quality mode for our MP3, which is gonna disable that option. And we're also gonna choose the highest quality export option, which is 320. Once that's done, we're gonna click on edit ID3 tag information. This opens up the metadata box for our MP3. Here we can establish a title for the song. We can enter our author and our album information as well. This allows us to assign a track number to it and the year that it was produced and also open up a genre box, which has an entire list of song genres. So simply pick one that's close to your particular genre for your song. And finally, a comments section or field. And this can contain quite a bit of information. This can be album information, production notes, or if you've been given or have purchased an ISRC code or number for your production by one of your CD distribution companies or streaming service companies like CD Baby or DistroKid or TuneCore, that information would also be entered here as well. The last thing to do is just confirm that our stereo output box is checked. From here, we simply add the job to the queue and hit the Start Queue Export button. And for the last set of export options, we want to make sure that our UV22 dither module is re-engaged. We want to make sure that that's now active. And we're also going to choose 16-bit here because we're going to be going from a 32-bit float environment down to the... CD distribution requirements of 16-bit, and we're also going to choose Auto Black. This just means that when there's no music present, it will gate the effect of the dithering module, so there's no musical artifacts. Once those changes are made, we simply go back up to the same file menu, navigate down to Export, and open the same Audio Export dialog box. And then from here, we also change from MP3 to WAV file. And we make a couple of other changes as well. We want to make sure that this is at 44.1K and that our bit rate is at 16-bit. These are our CD delivery requirements. These boxes here, we're going to leave in their default positions. We covered these in a previous video, so you might want to go back and get more information. We want to confirm our stereo output box is checked. And we also want to clear the queue and add this current job to the queue. We also want to do a separate audio export that's specifically for video. 
So we're going to retitle our wave export and we're going to check the destination for that as well. And then we're going to come down here and choose 48K since that's the delivery standard for video. We're going to leave this at 16-bit. And we're going to come down and hit the Add to Q button to add that job to our list. And the last export job we're going to do is for high-res audio since many places like iTunes can actually receive high-res audio files and play them back now. So we're going to change this back to 44.1K, but we're going to change the bit depth to 24-bit. And we'll title that accordingly. And then we'll add that to the job queue as well. From here, we simply hit the Start Queue Export button and all of these jobs will export for us automatically. It's a love song. So there's a step-by-step -step walkthrough of mastering your audio inside the Cubase environment for streaming services, for social media, and for other physical media platforms. Hey, if you learned something more, if this was helpful in any way, please hit the subscription and notification bells. It really does help keep the channel going. Be creative, stay safe, and we'll catch you guys in the next video.